You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. If I have to think about this, it's making it harder than it needs to be. We want to reduce cognitive load on the API. We want to make it so that you can see it and it's as complete as possible. And Laura, you and I have talked about this, is the fact that there's no real standard in terms of what's out there in terms of APIs. I can look at you know Google's versus Amazon's versus Facebook's versus Twitter's, and they're all written differently. Sometimes you're interpreting, like, you know, if we write API documentation now, I'm interpreting what the API has from what it was given by the engineers into language, as opposed to doing it this way, doing it annotated. I am looking at the code myself and I am seeing what the code does. And that is translating directly into the annotation, which is translating directly into the documentation. It's that interactivity of working on the same thing not sort of the same thing, not the same feature, you're working on the same code and that builds a better bond. Hello and welcome to the API Dedox podcast. Your hosts today are myself, Annette Pozsár and my colleague, Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and be a developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hey, Annette. And hi, Tony. It's good Hello. to see you again. Yeah, completely. So can we talk about the adoption of the Open API specification? Oh yes, this has been uh, <laughs> to the weeds. <laughs> yeah. This is four years in the running now. It's it's taken this long. Um, it's been part of this started out as a well, my baby has uh, once or twice a year what they call skunk works, mm-hmm. and you can come up with anything you want. And I was trying to find a way to simplify our API documentation, and part of that came from the fact that uh, basically every time we turned around, there was another API being added. With another resource or another endpoint and we're just like this is a lot to keep up with and that's when i started finding that there actually was a uh standard out there so i, I was when i did the first talk for api the docs i did some research on what was out there and you know there was blueprint there was open api so on and so forth and the reason open api for lack of better kind of won out was that we had an existing api and rewriting a specification from the ground up was not an option for us. I mean, I just knew that would get no traction because you'd be like, well, we've invested all this time. Fine, I respect that. So how do we make it work that we can actually have something that is automatically documented? That's when I looked into OpenAPI that I found um, Swagger Core, which is the Java, li- uh, the Java library that lets you write your annotations into the code, which then generates the spec file. Okay, that was a good find. And the thing is that uh, it, the adoption and the desire to have it done changed over time depending on who was involved. And when um, the team that manages our ops manager product or the, the engineers are ops manager product, they started seeing it as, as a good option to pursue because they're saying, well, look, if this happens, not only does it take care of the documentation, which to them is less of an issue, it opens up the opportunity to have SDKs automatically generated. It opens up the opportunity to maybe switch over to doing specification first development, uh, building interfaces without having to do any additional work, that kind of thing. Where they're like, they saw you know, also again, you can turn over the you can do mock servers where you can test the code without actually having a running server. And in some cases, that's good for us because we have a lot of APIs that are well, the one I want to say is that the amount of work it takes to get them to be active is more difficult. So for example, it's like, it's a feature that's optional or it's a feature that has to have some other condition already in existence to be able to be accessed. It's like, for example, you can't run an, uh, you can't request a, a restore uh, of a backup without having the backup there in the first place. So it's like, you have to set up the environment, then set up the backup, then let the backup run, then come back and try to do a restore. So it's like being able to test the API without having to do all that would be a huge benefit. Then we can also take the spec and give it to customers if they want to test themselves. Mm-hmm. Again, it, it has a lot of tangential benefit that they saw. And they're like, well, we need to, we should see this if make this happen. Um, not that the other groups didn't, it's just that for them, it was less of a priority. This team was like, look, we're doing a lot more stuff with Kubernetes. We're doing a lot more stuff with Docker. We're doing a lot more stuff with 
operate with service operators who are like, we need to have this stuff work, or we're doing stuff with uh, Terraform, for example. And Terraform usually will rely on your internal APIs. And they're like, this is these things become harder because this isn't there, mm -hmm. because we don't have it documented to the minute as to what things sit. And it's not that people, it's not like that the engineers were bad about giving us updates. It's just the fact that there was a lot of updates. Like it was, it's about 25% of our, of our documentation load right now, just writing specifications and specification changes, not tutorials, not how to's, not conceptuals, just the spec. And that's arguably not a great use of our time. Like I said, we're an eight person team. And if we could somehow get that 25% workload gone, we then have the equivalent of two bodies available to do something else. And then maybe we can do, uh, for lack of a better word, value add for APIs. We can write tutorials that say, if you want to create a cluster with users and database setups and da, 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 all through the API, we now have time to do that. Mm -hmm. We now have the ability to do that. And that's going to make a lot, then make them a lot and make the customers a lot happier because they can go, oh, now I see how I can do this. And then the spec is always updated. Every time they build the, the, the system, the specification files automatically generated, automatically sucked into the docs. We don't have to do a thing. It's always up to date. Do you see a pattern or can you draw the line what can be and can't be automated? Or what are the areas where you just can't neglect the human touch or the tech writer's touch? Well, I mean, the, 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 again, this is not meant to, yeah, I shouldn't say that the, the idea is that this doesn't involve writing is that, that we can invest our writing into the descriptions, for example, instead of trying to find every single uh, parameter, make sure we have them all. We know we have them all. We can then just make sure we've crafted a, a solid description that doesn't rely on us documenting a bunch of things that are just part of the spec. So for, again, for example, it's like ranges. Okay, minimum and maximum. I don't have to write it into the description. It doesn't have to apply because it's there as part of the, of the annotation and it'll generate it automatically and show me the range and I don't have to do anything else. So that's a good thing to, to, to take out of our hands. So that that's something we don't risk screwing up, but how to use it or uh, like why you would use a particular value or what its importance is, that's worth our time. And that's where we put more in it. Now, granted, right now, we, we, the project itself is split into two halves. One is forward-looking, one is backward-looking. The forward-looking is teaching the engineers how to write, teaching them how to make the annotations so that as they create new APIs, they don't need us to do it. We then, as technical writers, review what they've written because that's kind of the important part, making sure that they've, um, in making sure that it's uh, well-written English, basically. And the backward looking is backfilling all the APIs that already existed. And that's, I wanna say, some of the ballpark of 50 resources, probably 250 uh, endpoints. So we, that was the compromise we worked out. It's like, we will go back and backfill. We will go back and write the annotations because we also had to extract that out of the current documentation. That was the other trick. One of our, our technical writers wrote a script to yank all the descriptions out of the current documentation set. So we then just receive them into the code rather than having to write them all from scratch. Huge benefit on his part. Thank you, John. We love you. Um, so, then it's because of, because it's working in two directions, it's a case of no, neither one of us is delaying the other. If that makes sense. Like so, for example, if the engineers are comfortable with writing new ones, they can. If they want to start jumping in and annotating ones that they just wrote, they can do it because we've told them now. We again documented the process on how to do it and like what each field means and so on and so forth, because Swagger Swagger Core is a good library. It's it's the problem is what you don't realize when you're reading it and reading its documentation, and I didn't realize it, is you need to read it in tandem with the open API spec. Like it it doesn't it doesn't repurpose or reuse the information from the spec, which would have been helpful to realize if I had had that in big bold letters at the beginning. It's like go refer to this as well. 
when I had read them both together, it's like, oh, this makes a lot more sense. Here's what you want them to do. Um, and there's a, still a few kinks we're trying to work out. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the concept of discriminators, that's a big one right now, where you can go back and say that well, depending on the value of this field, these other fields may or may not appear. So we're trying to fold those in because it, it, we, we have a few, quite a few APIs that have that dependency. We're trying to work that out right now. But again, knowing how to annotate that is not automatic right now. We're trying to figure that part out. Um, but yeah, it, our goal is within the year to have it finished. Um, I wish I could say earlier. It might be earlier. I mean, I, I, I just don't want to uh, set expectations to something that I can't. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want my mouth to write a check my hands can't uh, cash. When you have that figured out and ironed out, or like, can you? Can you hold it? Talk about that because that's a bit. Oh, I, I totally want to. And they say I wanted to this time. It's just the fact that was it, the timing was just not there. Part of also the issue was that when we did this, in terms of like you know the awk and said and a grep discussion before, but what I was doing with that is that with all the things we captured, I had to go back then and write a couple of scripts to crack it into each individual resource. Then mm -hmm. I took each of those resources, put them in their own spreadsheet, pop them into Google Docs, and said, okay, everybody in the team, take a couple of these and edit the copy. Because one thing you don't think about is that the APIs were written at different times, okay? They were added at different. So we phrased things differently at different points. So for example, we said they may say like, you know, group ID, and it might just be say, one, one version may have said unique identifier for the project. Mm, okay, and then you can't cross-reference the conditionals if it's differently word. Well, that's just so much that. It's the fact that, again, it's like if you're a user and you see that exact thing that exact uh parameter referred to in 10 different ways you're going to wonder if which one's right so we we're trying to go back and have everybody edit them so they all read roughly the same if that makes sense like you know we say now like every every id parameter says you need 24 hexadecimal digits string that identifies blah in the specific specified blah so everyone's consistent you know, every single Boolean flag is, you know, flag that indicates whether, blah. It's like that way you're not going, does this mean this in one way and this in another? It's a lot of, uh, you know, general English, general parallelism, that everything reads the same. Um, just again, to re the phrase that has been a, been bubbling up in my to be in the past six months or so is uh, the term cognitive load. You know, yeah. the idea is that if I have to think about this, it's making it harder than it needs to be. So we want to reduce cognitive load on the API. We want to make it so that you can see it and it's as complete as possible. And you know, Laura, you and I have talked about this is the fact that there's no real standard in terms of what's out there in terms of APIs. I can look at you know Google's versus Amazon's versus Facebook's versus Twitter's and they're all written differently. And they all have different levels of, of detail. I'm trying to shoot for a level of detail that makes it really hard not to understand. And that means digging into a few things that are painful, like uh, regex patterns. I love one I'm, I'm, I'm currently fascinated with because they're painful to look at. But the idea is that if I tell you that something is exactly 24 characters and they're exactly hexadecimal, you can program against that. And you know that if it meets this parameter, it's going to be correct and it's going to work. And you know, or the times between this range and this range is 10, you know, 10 to 15 characters, 10 to 25 characters. Boom, you know to write your code to, to then you can write the uh, checks in your own application before it even hits us. Great. So we can't automate if it's not consistent on a consistent level and a human touch comes in that you need to enforce that consistency before you even start to automate. Is that it? It, it basically, yes. It's like it, it, the, the logic of it is going to be driven by a person. It's going to be something where you are truly bridging um, development and language. And that is done more so than anything else I've ever seen. Because they said sometimes you're interpreting, like, you know, if we write API documentation now, I'm interpreting what the API has from what it was given by the engineers into language, as opposed to doing it this way, doing it annotated. I am looking at the code myself and I am seeing what the code does. And that is translating directly into the annotation, which is translating directly into the documentation. And making sure that it's complete, that's the human part of it. 
I can't automate that part. The annotation relies on a human being to go back and say this. I mean, unless someone wants to write a tool to do that, I don't think anybody's even tried. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody should. Um, it, meaning that, like, you know, Swagger Core is a good library. It should, it's meant for, for, if I had my druthers, everybody, and I would recommend everybody just write the silly APIs from the spec out, okay? Yes, the spec is a little strict and can be a little ugly when you're using um, Swagger's tools, particularly. I mean, sorry, it's not very. You guys are great, but you know the, the fact that their their interpretation is so strict that it's sometimes it can be discouraging to want to do something because it'll keep telling you you're wrong. But if you do it that way and you create solid interfaces that you know will work, uh, it's a lot easier going forward. So doing the, doing this from the code out is hard mm -hmm. but it's far more possible than i ever thought it was and mm -hmm. it's it's generating a lot better results than i ever thought it was and it's still somewhat iterative which is which is decent but the nice part is because it's iterative because it's in the code and because our products get released every three weeks <laughs> the ability to make fixes fast is there so i mean like right now it's like it, it may take it before it may have taken us three weeks to even figure out what the problem was now we just know. We look at the code and go, mm, follow here, follow here, follow here. So it, it builds up the technical writer's technical knowledge, builds up the engineer's appreciation for the written word, and we become a heck of a lot more simpatico in terms of our views on what needs to get out the door. It's kind of nice, actually. It's, it's like that that partnership. It's kind of cool. I'm actually going to enjoy <laughs> it. I, I, my, my, all my engineers I work with primarily are either in New York or Dublin. So, and the, it's, it's that engagement and go, oh, I think I got this and have them go, yeah, yeah, and I see this. And then it's that interactivity of working on the same thing, not sort of the same thing, not the same feature, you're working on the same code. And that builds a better bond than I think just writing documentation for something they've already done because they may have, been, they may have already forgotten about it. They may be on to the next project, but if you're working on the same exact thing at the same exact time, there's it's like stream of consciousness is this war. Exactly. And it's like I said, I, I, I really I come to appreciate my engineers a lot more. I think they come to appreciate us a lot more. Um, and again, I'm also not doing it just as me because a big part of the project and what makes this thing work is figuring out how to delegate. That was the hardest part of this project is saying, what do I need to do as arguably the SME in this case versus what can be done by somebody who's familiar with the project. And that's why we started breaking up the, the all the writing and the description updates and stuff like that into multiple pieces, because then everybody in the, the team can touch it. You know, we have eight writers, all eight could touch it and hurt nothing. And then we could all move towards, I think that then we made the review process, for example, from the engineer standpoint, we didn't, you know, we all use GitHub because everybody uses GitHub. We didn't think, oh, you can do a group as an assignment. So we made an assignment. You can assign the review to API dash docs, and then all of us who are on that get notified and one of us can come in and pick it up. So there's no there's no bottlenecking. That was the other big thing. There's no bottlenecking. So it's like, oh good, we can make it happen, keep everything going in multiple streams of work rather than having everything bottleneck into one person and not go anywhere. <laughs> Tony, do you have a final message you would like to leave the listener with? Um to Big ones would be one. Um, whenever you have the opportunity to work directly with your engineers in the same place at the same time, well, same place in the, the 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 stream of work, take the opportunity. You'll build a lot better relationship with them, they with you, and your ability to have to explain what you do, and then just when they do what they do, will drop away. It's a big thing. The other thing is uh, again investing in getting investing less and trying to find the perfect person and investing more in making them the perfect person is time well spent and yes it's hard and can't deny you that but that build up that crafting of your perfect that your perfect technical writer for your company is important thank you and thank you for being here no thank you lovely i see you soon at the conference MongoDB.live took me out, took a lot out of us here. So thank you, Tani. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this. 
and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.